We are assuming, since the spacecraft did not emerge around the moon at the moment it would, if there had been no firing of its braking rockets at this time to go into lunar orbit, that it is going into lunar orbit, uh, which would mean that uh, we will hear from it again in uh, just about uh, eight minutes from now. It should uh, come back around uh, the right-hand side of the moon as we look at the moon and to be back in touch with Earth to report that it is successfully in lunar orbit. And then after about four hours or two orbits of the moon, it will fire again to go into a 69-mile high circular orbit of the moon. Right now, its orbit would be, if all has gone well, 69 miles by 195 miles, a slightly elliptical orbit uh, of the moon. The uh, rest of the schedule for the evening then would involve a, a television transmission of the moon's surface at around 9.30 tonight, a little after 9.30. Then Eugene Sermon, for the first time on this flight, climbs down into the lunar module at 10.30 tonight, Eastern Daylight Time, for a two-hour period, checking out uh, the systems of the lunar module. He climbs back into the command module, and the astronauts uh, turn in finally after a very busy day at 1.30 uh, tomorrow morning, after eight hours of sleep, the big day, when Stafford and Cernan take the lunar module down to within 10 miles of the moon's surface. Bruce Morton at the Manned Space Center in Houston. What's the mood down there right now in this waiting period? Very quiet in mission control, Walter. Uh, this has been kind of a good time flight so far. The astronauts uh, have had a lot of fun, and so have the people in mission control with the television transmissions, uh, the sights of uh, an upside-down John Young and so forth. But uh, all that's changed now, of course, with the spacecraft out of communication. Uh, there's a big crowd in mission control, along, of course, with the regular shift, the flight controllers. Uh, lots of astronauts have come in. Rusty Schweikert, who was, uh, of course, on the Apollo 9 flight. The Apollo 10 backup crew, Gordon Cooper, Don Isley, and Edgar Mitchell. Most of the high-ranking NASA officials who are normally here and a number who are stationed elsewhere. Dr. Werner von Braun, for example, the uh, chief architect of the Saturn rocket. Dr. Kurt Debus, head of the Kennedy Space Center, Deke Slayton, chief of the astronauts office, and uh, just a flock of executives from uh, North American and Grumman, the builders of the command and service module and the lunar module, respectively. The wives, as far as we can make out uh, on this monitor and from our pipeline into mission control, are all uh, staying at home watching this, I suppose, on television and uh, waiting uh, more anxiously than most of us to see how it comes out. I would think so, uh, probably. It's David Schumacher has been following this flight from the very beginning, keeping tabs of every uh, important uh, uh, transmission from the spacecraft and all of its maneuvers. And David, uh, you followed all of them before this, too, in the Apollo and before that the Gemini series. Uh, uh, what's the outstanding part of this flight uh, so far in your mind? Well, I don't have a particularly original observation, but I think you could say that it's what a difference 250,000 miles makes, uh, at least in the case of uh, this particular crew of astronauts. Uh, they are uh, a, a fairly uh, laconic bunch uh, here on the ground. Uh, Gene Cernan, uh, certainly talkative enough, but, but they're all uh, fairly sober individuals with quiet senses of humor, and uh, they, they kind of keep tight control of themselves, and to see them uh, in the past few days uh, hamming it up as they have has been uh, quite a big surprise to those who have uh, known them. It wasn't at all what we expected. It's the most talkative uh, space crew we've had in the Apollo program, certainly. They're keeping uh, the ground well advised of what they're doing, uh, and, uh, and their antics on television have been not only amusing, but informative. They have uh, insisted all along that uh, they were going to see that this time we, we on the ground uh, really shared in this experience of space flight. And of course, it, because we don't really know or understand the systems and the theories and all of the things that are working for them, uh, it seems more dangerous to us than it does to the men that are involved in it. And so I suppose that part of this is an attempt to reassure us that uh, space travel really isn't such a special thing. And uh, yeah, we'll be going along in not too many more years. One of the things that, uh, that I think Tom Stafford has done for all of us and for the space program, perhaps, is his insistence on the color camera to take it along on his flight. And he really pushed for that. And it may mean, with the great success of that Westinghouse camera, that we'll get color on the moon flight, Apollo 11, which had not been scheduled up to now. Do you, would you agree with that, David? I would think it would be almost impossible now, wouldn't it, for NASA to resist the uh, public pressure for a color look at the surface of the moon, even if the moon is only black and white. 
What are we going to find out about the moon? Uh, what do we know about the moon up to now, David? Uh, Incidentally, I'm keeping tabs here. We're about uh, three minutes now from that acquisition of signal. Well, I, they should come around. I would say that uh, we must be in pretty good shape up there around the moon right now. That another one of those cases where no news is, is good news. Uh, I suggested to a, a geologist the other day that uh, perhaps we knew more about the moon in some senses than we did about the Earth. And he said that at least in one sense he would agree with that. And that is that... Uh, the Earth is, of course, mostly covered by water, and uh, therefore uh, we do have a better idea of the topography of the surface of the moon. However, we don't have any idea at all of what's just underneath. Uh, we won't know that until we actually get down onto the surface, and once we do that, we'll have a pretty good idea, perhaps, of uh, the origins of the Earth, because so much of our own Earth is covered by this water. So that's what uh, I'm looking forward to. And we, uh, we're going to get... Uh some indication of that from the rock samples that they will pick up on Apollo 11 and then on future flights uh, I think the scientific experiments include actually some drilling uh, uh, small scale drilling of course to get a little bit uh, further down than just the surface of the moon doesn't it David? That's right. Uh, perhaps uh, we played down a little bit too much the uh, the tension here it's amazing how in just one flight you can get used to the idea of being that far away and, and all that's involved uh, it's obviously not just a, another day like any other uh, uh, the many of the astronauts uh, we know have, have gathered at mission control uh, the wives tend to gather in little groups uh, for mutual support uh, and they've got about a minute and a half to wait uh, any second now we could get that acquisition of signal of course they could be off a little bit on the calculations there they count on 512 as their uh, timing, of, uh, but uh, uh, such are the uh, radio waves that, of course, they can get small bounces and so forth. I suppose that they're watching very carefully now with just uh, a minute to go. You remember in, in eight there was, in Apollo 8, there was this time where we thought we heard carrier wave. We thought we heard something out there, but uh, it wasn't yet a good enough signal to, to uh, pick up the actual voices of the astronauts. There's another thing that uh, has occurred to me oh, in... One minute now. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> another thing that occurred to me in uh, considering the, uh, their position, the spacecraft uh, is really in the sun on the far side of the moon. You have the feeling that uh, they're lost out there in the, in the deep darkness, but uh, in fact uh, they're actually whizzing along in the bright sunlight, probably having one of the biggest thrills of their lives. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, don't they, they come into a dark period just before the acquisition of signal again. The right. Terminator, the, the, the dark side of the moon, as far as the sun is concerned, is actually about halfway, a little more than halfway around the moon. And they're in it now, or should be. And we should be hearing something in the next 20 seconds or so. Uh, these are breath-holding moments. Got word from them very shortly, it's hoped. Boy, that circuit up from Houston is certainly silent right now. <laughs> It'd be nice to have Jack Riley say anything on there. We've got it turned on. It's piping through. AOS. AOS, he said? They would pick up telemetry. Yeah. So they do have a telemetry signal from the spacecraft. It has come around. According to our simulation here, they should be seeing that Earth rise on the far horizon of the moon now. We are getting data. We don't have any voice communication yet. But at the time we got data indicates it was a very good burn. Meaning that the data came through at precisely 512. Jack Riley was on there immediately thereafter saying AOS, as you heard, acquisition of signal. The data comes down in thousands of bits of information per second. It's the telemetry information that is fed from all of the systems aboard the spacecraft, as well as the biological uh, reports, on respiration, heartbeat. Besides that, there are the voice circuits and the television circuits. I don't want to talk too much here because we want to hear those first words when they come through. Hello, Apollo 10, Houston, over. Uh, Roger, Houston, Apollo 10, you can tell the world that we have arrived. 
John Young reporting on the burn of the service propulsion system engine, which put the command ship and its attached lunar module into an absolutely perfect orbit around the moon, as had been planned months, even years ago, and is in the uh, in their logbook. They did exactly as uh, they were expected to do. The engines performed exactly as they were expected to perform, and the orbit around the moon is exactly what they had anticipated. It is uh, a important moment in the history of the Apollo program since this is the first firing of the uh, service propulsion system engine with the uh, lunar module attached uh, in uh, the lunar environment, and uh, there was no uh, a trouble with it, no anomalies, as they would say, in the uh, space program, no vibrations, no difficulties that might have been uh, anticipated. They did not happen, and everything is going exceedingly well up there. You heard the uh, happy voices of the astronauts as they came around the far side of the moon, and for the first time there in almost 45 minutes, were back in touch with Earth and could report uh, that they were in lunar orbit and that all was going well. They passed their, uh, their congratulations to the MSFN, the Manned Space Flight Network, for all of its work uh, in uh, putting them right on target. They were only one mile off and 11 minutes off when they arrived uh, by the moon uh, earlier today. They had only made one mid-course correction out of a possible four in their long three-day flight to the moon. Now they spend uh, two revolutions around the moon at this orbit, going out as far as 195 miles from the moon in the Apolloon or Apogee, the high point around the uh, moon, come back to that 69-mile low point. They fire their engines again at, uh, at the end of four hours to circularize the orbit at 69 miles, a little over 68, between 68 and 69 miles high, 
and uh, they stay in that orbit then uh, through uh, their stay uh, around the moon and uh, up to the time tomorrow when Tom Stafford and Eugene Sermon, Cernan depart from the uh, command ship in the lunar module, sweep down to within 10 miles of the moon's surface. Tonight at uh, 9.34 approximately, they're planning to send television to us uh, as, they, uh, as they are in their moon orbit and Cernan climbs down into the lunar module for a couple of hours of testing of instruments and so forth at uh, 10.30 tonight. We will be on the air for the uh, television coverage this evening, beginning at 9.30 Eastern Time. This is Walter Cronkite at the CBS News Space Center. This has been a CBS News special report, The Flight of Apollo 10, brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Next Apollo update on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. This is CBS.